Okay, so you've been diagnosed with SIBO. Now what? How do you treat it? If you go to Google and YouTube and the Reddit threads, you're going to find a million different options and it could be really overwhelming. You could do antibiotics. You could do herbal antibiotics, often called antimicrobials. You could do any number of SIBO diets, such as low FODMAP, SCD, biphasic diet, low fermentation diet. And you could even do something called the elemental diet, which is a very restrictive liquid only diet for two to three weeks. And most recently, the new kid on the block, the carnivore diet, has been suggested as a potential cure for this condition. But what is the answer? Can we really only treat this with diet, or do we need to rely on the herbs and the rifaximin, the antibiotics, and these other kill strategies? Is starvation a viable tool to be used alone when trying to tackle this overgrowth? In this video, I'm going to try to answer that question, acknowledging that we have very limited and very poor quality research on this topic. But as always, I'm going to try to summarize the existing research, and I'm going to tell you my clinical experience having treated this condition for a number of years. Stay tuned. Let's go ahead and start with the most popular SIBO diet, the low FODMAP diet. This is a diet that's only been around for 10 or 12 years. But despite that relatively short lifespan, we have a lot of really good quality research suggesting that the low FODMAP diet can help people with irritable bowel syndrome. Now, a lot of people with IBS go on to be diagnosed with SIBO later on, and it is often proposed that SIBO is the root cause of the IBS. I would say in those cases, it's a more appropriate label. It's not necessarily a root cause, but that's a topic for another day. So if a lot of people, about three quarters of people with IBS get some degree of symptomatic relief from low FODMAP, and a fair chunk of people with IBS have SIBO, it stands to reason that this diet can help people with SIBO too. And oftentimes that is the case. You guys can comment down below with your experience. I have seen pretty frequently that a lot of people with SIBO, not all, but a lot of people with SIBO get some degree of symptomatic management doing the low FODMAP diet. But here's the key. You can try to start the SIBO all you want with low FODMAP, but the minute you look cross-eyed at an onion, or a piece of garlic, or a piece of wheat, or a lentil, the bloating comes right back, the pain comes right back, the pooping problems return, and all of your lovely IBS SIBO symptoms return. Now this has led some SIBO experts like Allison Seebecker to suggest for a while now that people with SIBO just can't eat FODMAPs again. You just need to do low FODMAP indefinitely, and that's your way of keeping remission in place once you've treated the SIBO. But in my eyes, I've always viewed that as a very strong hint that you did not treat the SIBO or its root causes adequately. If you need this symptomatic band-aid that comes in the form of a diet for the rest of your life, there's probably something else that you did not address adequately. And if you were to address it adequately, you could eat the FODMAPs again. And that has been my clinical experience. If we really get to the roots of the SIBO, why the person got SIBO and all of the interconnectedness of the body, I find that people with even the worst cases of SIBO can in fact enjoy a wide variety of FODMAPs in the diet again. So that's my clinical experience, but what about the research? So up until this year, we really had practically zero good quality research that tried to look at this. Um, recently, I believe it was August of 2022, I'm going to link it down below and I'll try to pop it up on the screen. There was a paper called Efficacy of an Irritable Bowel Syndrome Diet in the Treatment of Small Intestinal Bacterial Overgrowth, a Narrative Review. And this was the first paper that I'm aware of that really actually looked at using diets like the low FODMAP diet to try to treat SIBO and it was looking at the pros and the cons of doing so. And they had some pretty strong things to say. They said a low FODMAP diet can promote a negative shift in the gut microbiota and deepen the existing state of dysbiosis in SIBO patients. Not something you want to do. They also said that a low FODMAP diet can be seen as anti-prebiotic because of the decrease in beneficial bacteria that is seen very frequently in people who do this diet. So we have it being called anti-prebiotic. They are saying that it will deepen the dysbiosis in these people. And we know that dysbiosis causes inflammation. We know that dysbiosis will cause leaky gut and candida and all sorts of unwanted stuff. So what are we to do? In a weird way, the answer is kind of easy and kind of right in front of all of our faces. On the one hand, like I said, if you need this symptomatic band-aid to manage your SIBO symptoms, and the minute you look at an apple or a piece of garlic, they come roaring right back, 
that is a very strong, very clear indication that you didn't treat the SIBO adequately in the first place. You need to go back to the foundations and think about not necessarily do I need an antimicrobial or an antibiotic, but you need to go back and think what is affecting my gut brain axis? What is affecting my motility? What is affecting my stomach acid and my ability to make enzymes? Am I rushing through my meals? Am I super stressed? Am I sleeping enough? Am I moving enough? Is my nutrition adequate for a healthy human being? Am I getting enough protein and healthy fat and carbs and minerals and vitamins? These are the sorts of things that are really unsexy and unglamorous, but they are foundations for a reason. They're foundations for a healthy body. And you can't expect to be SIBO free if you have an unhealthy body. That's at least how I explain it to my patients and my students. So on the one hand, you can go back to the drawing board, revisit SIBO, but perhaps from a different angle. If you want more of a discussion on that, my podcast co-host and I talk about it a lot on the IBS Freedom Podcast. So go check those episodes out. I think it's loaded with good information and we try to make it fun as well. The yeah. other thing to know is that the low FODMAP diet, the, the elimination phase that we all know of and we all call the low FODMAP diet, that phase of the diet is only meant to be done for two to six weeks. Monash University, the group of people who is actively researching low FODMAP and developing apps and developing websites and teaching about this, they have explicitly said for years online and in their course for diet dietitians that the elimination phase, the first phase of low FODMAP is only meant to be done for two to six weeks. But I'll tell you right now, I see boatloads of people who have been doing low FODMAP for months or years, if not longer. So what gives? Well, in my experience, the people who wind up stuck on low FODMAP have been told by well-intentioned clinicians that this is a treatment for SIBO or it's starving the SIBO. And again, that's just not true. The people who have gone through uh, working with a dietitian who's trained by Monash and actually are implementing the diet correctly usually are no longer doing the super restrictive version of the diet by the time they see me because they know that it's only for symptomatic relief. It's not treating the underlying root causes of IBS or SIBO. So whether you want to take it from my clinical experience and get back to the unsexy basics, or if you want to listen to the literal authority on the low FODMAP diet, this is meant to be a temporary diet and it is not a treatment. It is just a symptomatic band-aid. And to be clear, symptomatic band-aids and crutches are not bad things. Sometimes you need something to just help you function and help you get by while you're busy working on the root cause. So I'm not knocking it necessarily. I don't want to give the impression that I never use the low FODMAP diet in my practice because I do, but oftentimes my goal is to get people back into eating FODMAPs as soon as humanly possible. Now, more recently, again, low FODMAP, that's been a thing for SIBO for a while. It's the talk of the town. Everybody knows about it at this point. And the, um, the dialogue in the SIBO space is that it will starve the SIBO and therefore it is a treatment strategy for SIBO. Again, this has been advocated by many famous IBS and SIBO clinicians. This is very much the current state of the SIBO world as of the recording of this video. But then it begs the question, if we can starve the SIBO with something like low FODMAP, again, I don't think you can, but if we can starve with low FODMAP, Maybe if we do a much more extreme version, we could get even better improvement. So there are things like the elemental diet that boasts an 85% elimination rate. Now keep in mind, when, how much do they follow up with those people in these studies? I have yet to meet a person, granted there's gonna be some selection bias in my work, I have yet to meet a person who did the elimination diet and then they were totally cured afterwards and they were able to reintroduce all or most of the foods and just frolic off into the rainbows with no SIBO symptoms. Usually, if anything, what happens is people feel okay on the low or on the elimination or sorry, they feel okay on the elemental diet and then they gradually add back in foods and their symptoms gradually return in the process, even if they have a negative SIBO test. So I really don't think the elemental diet is as, uh, as stupendous as the numbers might make you think it is. But then we have another extreme version. If you think about eliminating fiber and eliminating carbs as the starvation tactic that's proposed, the other most extreme version of this would be to do carnivore. 
And indeed, there is a more recent paper. I think it was 2021. I'm going to link it also to this. Um, first off, I want to point out this is not indexed on PubMed. So the quality is most likely going to be lower. And indeed, when I read the paper, I thought it was a lower quality article compared to the IBS diet and SIBO paper that was shared earlier in the video. So automatic, little bit of a red flag. It's not indexed on PubMed, but I took a look anyway. It's titled, A Zero Carbohydrate Carnivore Diet Can Normalize Hydrogen Positive SIBO Lactulose Breath Test, a case report. And they followed, I believe it was six people, and they had them do a strict carnivore diet for, I think it was two to six weeks, and then they repeated the breath test. Now, I want to do a separate video talking about this study because I think it's important to really critically look at research that, that goes against the majority of other research. So like all other research practically suggests that dietary fiber and plant foods are very nutritious and potentially necessary for microbiome health. This paper is suggesting the opposite, which makes me think I really need to critically appraise it if it's going against the bulk of the rest of the research out there. But again, that's going to be another video. Now, the two big things that I thought were weird about this paper, um, or low quality, I guess, um, for one, they used lactulose breath tests and they used a 90 minute cutoff mark. Now I'm going to do another video in the future on this channel talking about why lactulose breath testing is truly horrible. It is so ridiculously unreliable. Honestly, I, I don't order it anymore. I think it is unusable. That is how bad lactulose breath testing is. And there's a lot of research suggesting that that is true. I don't base this off of just willy nilly hypotheses. This is based off of research. So A, they're using lactulose, which is notoriously, notoriously inaccurate and gives a ton of false positives for SIBO. Then they use a 90 minute cutoff range, which is way too long for lactulose. And that probably means that they are over-diagnosing SIBO in the patient population they are seeing. Well, so now we have a group of people of six people who supposedly have SIBO, but now we don't know because we know that they're using a sugar at a cutoff time that is unreliable and inaccurate. So who the heck knows if these people actually have had SIBO before. But the other thing I thought was really peculiar about this particular paper is they specifically said, Low FODMAP is not relevant as a SIBO treatment, but rather to give some relief to IBS. So on the one hand, they are discrediting another diet that is proposed to starve the SIBO, but then they're saying that their diet starves the SIBO better. I don't, I don't know if that really works as an argument. Like you can't say that another starvation diet doesn't actually treat the SIBO, but then say that your starvation diet does treat the SIBO. That doesn't make a heck of a lot of sense to me. Um, anyway, I've got, I'm going to do a video a little bit later on looking at that paper a little bit more in depth and going kind of line by line. But my takeaway right now is that the carnivore diet is just a more extreme version of what we're doing with low FODMAP. If you cut out some degree of fiber and some degree of carbohydrates and you get a little bit of benefit, and then you cut out a medium amount of carbohydrates and fire, fiber, and you get a medium benefit, you could cut out all of the carbohydrates and fiber and potentially have beautiful symptomatic improvement. But is that curing the condition? I would argue no. You take those people who have done carnivore and the minute they reintroduce a plant food, they're probably gonna get a lot of those familiar SIBO symptoms. So they are keeping it in remission, which is, again, not without value. I'm not knocking that part of it, but they are inducing remission. They are not curing the condition. I think that is true of any SIBO diet. I think that is true of elemental, and I think that it is true of carnivore, both based off of what I have seen clinically and the available research that we have right now. So bringing it in, let's wrap up. Let's, let's try to make something out of this mess of a video because now you might be feeling a little bit frustrated or bummed thinking that this, this option that you thought was viable is no longer viable. Again, I wanna reiterate, these diets can help manage symptoms. So if you are really in a lot of pain, you're very uncomfortable, you can't get away from the toilet, these are the sorts of situations where I might have somebody do low FODMAP as a trial run for two to six weeks and see if we get symptomatic improvement 
and then we go about trying to strategically introduce the foods again. You could do this with a trained dietitian who's gone through the Monash University course. They do have a dietitian locator on their website. Um, I'm not a registered dietitian, so I'm not listed on there, but RDs who have taken the course and passed all the quizzes would be listed on there. Um, you know, you could go through it with a dietitian. You could potentially go back and watch some videos on this channel or again on the IBS Freedom Podcast. We have an entire podcast episode about the low FODMAP diet. We have an entire episode about SIBO diets. We have an entire episode on food reintroduction. We have a lot of episodes that can help you through this process, as well as getting to those unsexy, unglamorous basics that I talked about, those foundations that really help you treat the thing. Um, also on this channel, I have some videos on the low FODMAP diet and reintroduction strategies. I propose two different reintroduction strategies, one from me and just my, my kind of clinical preference and one from Monash University and the dietetic world. So go check out the other videos. I think they will help you through this. But again, these are symptomatic band-aids. They are crutches to be used when you need some help managing symptoms. But according to the available literature that we have right now and my clinical experience and the clinical experience of others like Amy Hollenkamp, my podcast co-host, these diets don't actually treat SIBO. So you need to do other stuff too. Hey guys, if you like this video, be sure to subscribe, ring the bell, click the like button and leave a comment down below with the videos that you would like to see me do next. Doing all of those really helps support the channel and support my efforts in making as many videos as possible for you guys. Thanks so much and I'll see you in the next video.